This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. Number 11, Catholicism. So here I intend to cover 500 years of Catholic development in 45 minutes. Are you ready? This is a, a book that I use as a source for this lecture and for some other uh, future uh, subjects that I'll be talking about. It, it covers, it's by Tim Grass, uh, and it covers the period from 1648 to uh, the present. It's called Modern Church History. And it's a, it's a good textbook if you're interested in, in getting a, a, an overview of the different movements during this period, both in Europe, in America, and in other places as well. And so I just wanted to mention that to you before jumping in. So what happened when Luther started his Reformation, started his movement of protesting against the Catholic Church in the 1500s? What was the Catholic response? I haven't talked about the Catholic response yet. And so what Pope Leo X said, more or less, was that uh, this is just some sort of drunken brawl among uh, the German monks. It'll, it'll pass. And uh, he, the general thought was the Protestants are just lustful and, you know, they, and disobedient. They pointed to Luther's marriage as something that was deeply offensive. If you recall, Luther had married a nun. And one of his reasons that he mentioned himself was to offend the Pope, which he succeeded in doing. And then in 1541, we have something called the Regensburg Colloquy, which was an attempt to get uh, Catholics and Protestants together. And they drafted a position paper in 1541, and both the Pope and Luther rejected it. <laughs> so there wasn't much hope at, at healing this uh, division that had happened early on. And so what we have then is the Council of Trent. But before I come to the Council of Trent, I just want to mention a few things about the Inquisition. Uh, the Inquisition is a, a, Catholic, a, a part of the Catholic Church that had started as early as the 12th century. So it had been around for hundreds of years by the time of uh, the Reformation in the 1500s. And the Inquisition was something that was developed to combat Cathars and Waldensians, which I'm not going to get into what their beliefs were, but they were different groups that had beliefs divergent from the Catholic Church. And so the Inquisition was in, especially strong in, in Spain and Portugal, but also in other places as well. And it persecuted Jewish and Muslim converts that were suspected of secretly continuing to practice their old belief system. Um, so, for example, in the 1578 Handbook for Inquisitors, it spelled out the purpose of the penalties, which is, quote, for punishment does not take place primarily and per se for the correction and the good of the person punished, but for the public good in order that others may become terrified and weaned away from the evils they would commit. So this is a deterrent strategy. This is sort of one of the reasons that people give for the death penalty is that it will deter others from committing a similar crime. So the Inquisition was very self-consciously uh, designed to not help the person that was the sheep that had wandered astray from the church. It was more to torture and execute publicly that sheep so no other sheep would get the same idea. And uh, a lot of times what would happen is someone would get... Uh, arrested and tortured by the Inquisition to, and then asked to implicate others who also were secretly practicing illicit faiths. And then they would be brought in and tortured and asked to tell, other, tell on others. And so it spread. It was just a terrible, terrible um, time for the church. Uh, they also persecuted sor sorcerers and witches and uh, things like that. In 1821, the Inquisition was finally abolished in Portugal. And in 1826, the last execution was carried out in Spain. In 1834, they finally outlawed the Inquisition in Spain. And then in 1908, the Inquisition 
got renamed to the Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office. You always have to be a little worried, a little weary, when they name something holy or sacred. It's like, why do we have to add that in, you know, uh, if, if it already is? But anyhow, it was cleaned up in 1908 as the Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office, and then it was renamed in 1965, more recent times, as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And so the Inquisition is still with us, actually. They're not, uh, it's not an arm of the Catholic Church used to torture and execute people anymore, but it is an arm that's still doing the same job, which is rooting out people that are uh, di diverging from the church, and it, its authority is over Catholics only. And uh, so, for example, in 2001, the CDF promoted Catholic morality, and it was dealing with the priests who were accused of pedophilia in the Catholic Church. Okay, so that's, that's the Inquisition. It's an, uh, an aspect of the Catholic Church that had been around since the 12th century and in an, a much tamer form is still with us today as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Now we, we need to talk about the Council of Trent. Pope Paul III called for and convoked the Council of Trent in the year 1545, and it lasted till 1563. There were a couple of breaks in there, but just to simplify, this is a council that went more or less for 20 years. Um, the, the purpose of this Council of Trent was to deal with the issue raised by Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and others who were breaking away from the Catholic Church, and it was a response. What do we do? Our church is, is breaking into pieces here. And so Christianity after the Council of Trent is called Tridentine uh, Catholicism after the Council of Trent, and before it, uh, we just call it medieval Catholicism. So we have almost a whole different kind of Catholicism uh, coming in. I mean, it's not totally different. It's just there are, there are some changes. For example, on the doctrinal front, they affirm the seven sacraments, which have been questioned by a lot of these protesters, uh, including transubstantiation and the people not being able to take the cup in communion. They rejected justification by faith alone, and they affirmed that Doctrine is built on Scripture and tradition. It's not built on Scripture alone. Luther's uh, motto was sola scriptura. The Catholics are saying not sola scriptura. Scripture and tradition. And um, this, this is also a time when they included the Apocrypha as an official part of the canon of Scripture. These are the books found uh, in the Catholic Bible that are not in other Bibles. It was at this time. They had been used for a long time, but they were officially declared legitimate here. The main, the main difference that we find with the, the Council of Trent is that they really cracked down on abuses by the priests and the bishops, and they, they cleaned house. And so, for example, they said that a bishop needs to be a pastor of a diocese not a prince of the church. There's a real different mindset there, right? If you're a pastor, you care for the people. If you're a prince, the people are your subjects to serve you, right? To uh, pay for your whatever it is kind of life you want to live. The bishops had to live in their diocese now. They had to preach regularly. Their job was to inspect the clergy to ensure proper teaching. And they're supposed to meet regularly at meetings called synods. The bishops were all told to start seminaries in each diocese for the training of clergy separate from the university because if somebody went to the university they ended up becoming Protestant. So Catholics are starting their own seminaries for the training of their clergy as a result of the Council of Trent. Um, and no more concubinage, so no more live-in girlfriends uh, allowed for priests and bishops. They supported the Baroque style of architecture as part of the, the Council of Trent, the result of Council of Trent art architecture and music and in uh, 1559 they came out with uh, during this season they came out with the index index of prohibited books which uh, is a list of books there, there had been a list around since 1521 in Paris and Louvain but this was an official list put out by the church that had all the books you're not allowed to read on it 
Okay, so if you got caught with a book that was on this list, the index of prohibited books, then you would be charged with heresy and the Inquisition would deal with you. And so they looked at heresy, which is any belief that disagree with their belief, as an infectious disease that is carried by two things, people and books. And so this is how they dealt with the book aspect. The people aspect was dealt with by the Inquisition. Um, books on the list included most translations of the Bible, the majority of the church fathers, so ancient Christian writings, early Christian writings were not allowed to be read unless you had the written permission of a bishop. Uh, the works of Luther obviously would be on the list. The works of Erasmus, who was actually a Catholic, were on the list. And uh, they had some books on there that you could read, but they were expurgated, which means that certain parts of it were blacked out, so you couldn't read the offensive parts of the book. So they were heavy, cens heavy censorship. In 1966, this index of prohibited books was abolished. Abolished. That's not how you spell abolished. Abolished? Is that how you spell it? Okay. Uh, but however, to this day, there is a uh, uh, designation that's called imprimatur. And it means, let it be printed. And this is on books that the Catholic Church thinks would be good for its followers to read. So this is an example of that. This is uh, um, Isaac Newton's famous book, the Principia, and you see in the middle there it says imprimatur. In other words, let it be read. So rather than saying you can't read books, it's saying you should read this book. And uh, I looked up in my, uh, in my office at a book I had written by a Catholic, uh, Peter Kreeft, and uh, sure enough, right, right in the beginning part, there it is, imprimatur. You know, the Catholic Church officially endorses this book, although it had like another clause as if not necessarily everything in it you know, so let it be read, but we don't necessarily endorse everything in it. And uh, in 2011, the imprimatur first applied to an iPhone app. So we have uh, iPhone apps that are now officially authorized by the Catholic Church. All right. Another thing that happened in the 1500s, a massive event, was the result of this man, Ignatius of Loyola. He lived from 1491 to 1556, an absolutely fascinating person. Uh, he's the sort of person that either you love or you hate. Uh, th there aren't people that are just like, oh, well, he was a nice guy. He wasn't a nice guy. He was an extremely intense guy that either you thought he was saving the world or damning it. Okay, and uh, I'll let you figure out which, which side you fall on in a minute here. This is him dressed in his armor because he started out in the military. In uh, 1521, he was in a battle and he was severely wounded by a cannonball. Cannons had just come out, and uh, so they were on the, the machine guns weren't out yet, but the cannons were out, and he got hit by a cannon. It shattered one leg, and it wounded the other. The shattered leg healed incorrectly, and so he had it broken and reset. Now, keep in mind, this is before anesthesia, all right? So his, his leg is shattered. It heals. He's like, ah, it's crooked. Break it, reset it. They break it, they reset it. It heals crooked again with a protruding bone below the knee. And so one leg ended up being shorter than the others. So he ordered the doctors to saw off, saw off the knob of bone and stretch his leg. And after all that, it was still unsuccessful and he walked with a limp the rest of his life. He was an intense man. And he wanted to have, you know, in their, in their society, you, you wanted to put your best foot forward. You know, you wanted, to, <laughs> you wanted to walk evenly, and you didn't want people to think that you were, you know, defective or something. And so that was important to him. Anyhow, during his long recuperation, you could imagine this would be a long recuperation, he read uh, a number of books. He, he tried to get some other books that were more entertaining and sinful, but he ended, they didn't have any on hand, so he ended up with uh, On the Life of Christ by Ludolf Saxony. And he reads this book about the life of Christ and has this amazing conversion experience. And he starts reading all these other books on the life, uh, life of Jesus books and Lives of the Saints, these kinds of books. And he decides that 
To be a saint, a true child of the church, is better than to be a knight on the battlefield. It's more impressive, it's more difficult, it's more challenging. And so he starts imitating people like Francis of Assisi, and he starts tr trying to think of himself as a monk, and he dedicates himself to the Virgin Mary as a spiritual knight. In 1522, he stays in a cave for a little while as a hermit, and he practices severe asceticism, which is denying himself pleasure, denying himself, a lot of fasting involved, denying sleep, things like that. And he had some visions at that time. The next year, in 1523, he went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land because he decided he was going to go convert the Muslims. He got there, and he did not convert the Muslims, and he ended up coming home. And in 1524, he developed and finished his spiritual exercises. These are ways of reading scripture meditatively. Uh, Ignatian contemplation, for example, is one of them that, that uh, is where you put yourself into the, into the scene of, of the Bible. You try to visualize what they saw, feel what they felt, hear the sounds they heard, and so on. And that's um, one of his spiritual exercises. He returns to Spain and he starts preaching on the street corners and he decides he needs to get educated. So in 1528, um, well, before 1528, or 1528, he went off to the University of Paris and got a master's degree. And he probably overlapped with John Calvin, who was also at the University of Paris around that time. Now, these two couldn't be more opposite because Ignatius of Loyola becomes the most dedicated and committed Catholic of the 16th century. Okay, maybe that's an overstatement, but definitely one of them. And John Calvin is someone who leaves the Catholic Church and fights against the Catholic Church for his entire life in Geneva as a leader of the Reformation. And so it's interesting they might have overlapped. In 1534, this is a big date, he starts the Jesuits. And uh, he does it with six companions and they take solemn vows. The Jesuits. Uh, the first three letters there are the, the uh, English equivalents of the Greek letters of Jesus' name. So it's, it's almost like J-E-S in English would be. But uh, in, in uh, Greek, it's Jesus, so that's the uh, Yoda, Eta, Sigma. Um, and so this, this organization is officially approved by the Pope. So it's not just some random person that's doing his own thing. The Pope says in 1540, I officially recognize this as a society, just like the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Carmelites, the Beguins, the Benedictines, all these different uh, groups of officially recognized Catholic uh, orders. And there are rules of the order of the Jesuits. Has anybody ever met a Jesuit before? Okay, a couple of you have. Uh, you did, okay. I was once, uh, when, it, when a Jesuit tries to recruit you, well, first of all, you have to be a guy, uh, but uh, when he tries to recruit you, the, the opening line is, are you married? That's how, they, that's how they get started. And if you say yes, you're off the hook. If you say no, then it's like you've got to come to the secret meeting and try to get you in, involved because you have to be a, a celibate for life in order to be a, a part of the Jesuit order. Uh, they took vows of poverty, chastity, uh, they accepted orders to go anywhere in the world. This is all part of the deal if you're going to sign up to be a Jesuit. You, have to leave, you, you may have to live in extreme conditions. I'll get to that in a minute. And they're thought of the Marines of the church as God's soldiers, the sort of cream of the crop of the Catholic church. And they vow direct obedience to the Pope. I have a quote here for you. This is rule number 13. It says, that we, that we may be altogether of the same mind and in conformity if the church shall have defined anything to be black, which to our eyes appears to be white, we ought in like manner to pronounce it to be black. Absolute obedience to the church and especially the Pope. If, if, if the church says it's black, it's black. I don't care if you th your eyes tell you it's white. Your eyes are wrong. And that's the sort of dogged, dogged obedience that we have here. Ordination takes between 8 and 14 years of training. And then you still can't take your vows for a few years after that. It's by far the longest of all the orders to become a Jesuit uh, priest. And they were a vigorous group of people. This is Francis Xavier. Uh, Matt Elton shared about his role in uh, Chinese Christianity. 
or in Japanese Christianity. This is the man who preached in India and had great success in Japan. You see the IHS by his sword there, or not sword, a cross coming out of the heart. Uh, that is the uh, Jesuit motto. Matteo Ricci, uh, dressed as a Confucian scholar and brought Christianity to China. And Robert Nobili mastered Sanskrit and brought Chris Christianity to the Brahmin caste in India. And then we have Alexander de Rhodes, who preached in Vietnam. These Catholic Jesuits are going off doing missionary work before anyone else is even thinking about this subject. I mean, it's really something how far ahead of the, the game they were. So we're talking about Japan, China, India, Vietnam, but there's a whole other part of the world that gets a lot of Catholic influence as well, the Americas. From Canada to um, the middle part of the United States, where the Louisiana Purchase was, to Central, Mexico, Central America, and South America, you have Jesuits going over there, willing to do anything for the cause, uh, to preach to the natives, to make converts, to make uh, Catholic communities centered on a church, and they travel with the colonialists as they go over there and take over these places. The Jesuit priests are, are doing missionary activity along with them. This is Pope Alexander VI, who awarded colonial rights to Spain and Portugal a year after Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Um, Alexander VI gave them official colonial rights. So long as they brought Catholic priests with them, to convert the, uh, the natives. And so the king of Spain and Portugal had the right to appoint bishops for a while. Uh, from 1519 to 1521, Spain conquers the Aztec Indians. In 1531 to 1536, they conquered the Incas. So this is all happening around the same time. They treat the, the natives as barbarians and they enslave them. The most deadly thing they do by far, is they bring smallpox and other diseases that the natives have no resistance to. And just incredible percentages of the population are totally wiped out by small things like uh, smallpox and you know, uh, typhus and things like that that the, the uh, Europeans brought with them. Um, also around this time, we have Teresa of Avila, who was a Spanish mystic. Uh, had visions of Christ, some pretty weird stuff where she got, uh, I think, stabbed repeatedly uh, by Christ or somebody, and it felt really good. And she had these really weird visionary experiences, but she was officially recognized as a legitimate visionary uh, or a mystic as part of the Catholic Church, and she started a, uh, a group of discalced Carmelites, which means they don't wear shoes. Um, and uh, she was very influential. There's, there's a lot more I can say about her, but I'm doing 500 years in oh, just a few minutes here. So I'm running, running on then. Uh, Gregory the 15th is the uh, man who in 1622 founded the Sacred Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith. Whew. They didn't like short names back then, I guess. And so he, he founded this as an organization to supervise all the missionary work that was happening. So already in 1622, now we have a missionary oversight committee that is dedicated to handling issues that come up with missions. And what he did in uh, 1622 is he put international Christians under the, the Pope's authority and no longer under the, uh, under the authority of the kings. This man, Ur Pope Urban VIII, in 1627 established a missionary training school. And so our, already in the 17th century, the Catholics are heavy into missionizing, which brings us to the Chinese rights controversy, which we already have uh, covered uh, before, so I'm not, not really going to go into it other than just to say they waffled back and forth on whether or not the Chinese Christians, the converts, were allowed to venerate their deceased ancestors, and eventually the church decided in uh, 1715 is the official declaration by Clement XI that these Chinese rites are illegal, they're, they're improper, they're heretical, we don't, we don't allow this. Uh, and so there was some going back and forth there. One of the next major things that happens for Catholicism in, is in the 18th century, uh, the French Revolution. The French Revolution is absolutely 
massive for Catholicism. Uh, if you recall, uh, the, the th probably the three biggest supporters of Catholicism in this time period are, are Spain, Spain and Portugal, and then you have, of course, Italy and France. You remember when I told you the story of the Reformation in France? And the, the comeback is, what Reformation? There, there wasn't a Reformation in France. They, they tried. There was the affair of the placards, and there was St. Bartholomew's Day massacre, and all this, and the, the Edict of Nantes, and everything else. But eventually, France just remained Catholic. Uh, and so the French Revolution, which took place from 1789 to 1799, uh, I don't know where they got the idea of a revolution from. Maybe America? 1776, right? But uh, anyhow, 1789 to 1799, Thomas Jefferson was there, by the way, at least in the beginning, of the French Revolution. They decided they wanted to get rid of the, the king, King uh, Louis the Sixteenth, And doesn't he look like such a good king? Uh, but he wasn't, a, he wasn't such a good king. Um, and uh, in these 10 years, from 1789 to 1799, I'm not going to go into all the details. I'm just going to kind of briefly cover it. We have no less than five governments. Governments, not different rulers, but forms of government. We start out with monarchical absolutism. That's another way of saying the king's way or the highway. Right? So you have a king that's declaring everything. And then we go from there to a constitutional monarchy, which means, well, the king's there, but if the constitution and the people interpreting the constitution agree with the king, then we'll do it. And we go from that to a radical republic, and in 1793, King Louis the 16th gets the guillotine and loses his head. And then after that, we end up with a five-person directory, a reign of terror, in which this, this incredibly efficient instrument is put to a lot of use. And then eventually, we get a dictatorship under Napoleon. And so the French Revolution is this really complicated period of history where we have governments toppling each other. It begins with people crying out, liberty, I, I guess this is French, liberty, egality, fraternity. I probably said it wrong, but liberty, equality, brotherhood is what they're crying out. These are the, the cries of the revolution. They're sick and tired of being told what to do, working all their hours and giving their money to the noble landowners in the feudal system. They're done with it. They want equality. And so the people in France, they don't want to be the king's subjects anymore. They want to be the citizens of the nation. That's a big, that's a big change. You know, that's normal for us. We think of ourselves as citizens. We don't think of ourselves as uh, the president of the United States subjects, right? We think of ourselves as American citizens. It changed the relationship of church to state. Uh, that's not, that's not a small, in a small way. It's a massive change. At one point, one of these governments uh, decides they're going to take the, all of the monasteries, all of the church property, all of the bishop, the clergy, the priests, and, and, and make them loyal to the French government, not to the Pope of Rome anymore. And so they required all of the clergy to swear a, a vow of allegiance to France, and about half of them, or less than half of them, do it. And the rest of them say, we're not doing it. We're loyal to the church. We're not, you know, we live here, but we're not, you know, going to make this oath of allegiance. And so they all get fired. And then there's, you know, it's just revolution after revolution. Uh, the king becomes a figurehead. Uh, the nobility ends up losing all their lands. The church lo loses all its monasteries. The government, uh, the, the, pe the people say, no, the government is supposed to serve us, not the king. And people begin participating in government. There's voting, but it's, it's kind of shady uh, where you're voting somebody who's going to vote the main person in. And uh, a lot of the liberties get suspended that the people were promised because of the turmoil. And so you don't actually end up with liberty for a while. And um, people end up electing the bishops and the judges and the magistrates. And there's the emancipation of the individual. There's this whole movement that's, that's washing through. We'll, we'll talk about this later called the Enlightenment. And this is really the emancipation of the individual. Where you, start, where you think of yourself as having rights and having uh, determining things based on the individual rather than based on the group or, or the, um, 
uh, the country. And so the Enlightenment plays into this. Uh, they attempt to get rid of the Catholic Church. There are a couple of really nasty periods uh, where they establish the cult of reason. And then the, the, the cult of uh, the supreme being comes in after that. But they get rid of Sunday, holy days, saints, prayers, rituals, ceremonies. They just full-on decide they're going to re-engineer society as a whole. And most of it fails. Which brings us to the Napoleonic Wars. Here is Napoleon with his famous sideways hat on his horse. Just an incredible uh, warrior. Um, a, a Frenchman. Well, actually, he was from Corsica. He wasn't really French. But um, he, uh, he came to be a general in France. And uh, there were wars. There were, during the, the period of the Revolution, you have wars without as well as wars within. And at one time, uh, the, the, not only England, but also Austria and Prussia and Russia, everybody wants a piece of France. You know why nobody, why everyone wants to attack France during the period of the revolution? Because they don't want the revolutionary chaos and equality ideas to spread. So they'd rather conquer France and put it back the way it was than have this revolution spreading from country to country like a cancer. And so France needs somebody that can fight wars. And that's how Napoleon rises to power. These wars of Napoleon last from 1803 to 1815. And uh, he fights against England, Austria, Prussia, and Russia. And he conquers much of Europe. Pope Pius VI, I'm not going to tell you the whole political story about Napoleon. I just want to focus on how it affects Catholicism right now. But uh, Pope Pius VI condemned the French Revolution when it happened. And in, um, as a result, uh, things did not go well for him. Um, the church had lost its power, had lost its authority, had lost its right to appoint bishops. And Napoleon Bonaparte's general invaded Italy, took over the Vatican, and grabbed Pope Pius VI and brought him away to France, who then died in exile. So the pope gets kidnapped and dies in exile. The next pope comes on the scene, and Napoleon decides he's not going to be the same as the revolution, totally anti-Catholic, but he's going to recognize that although France is not a Catholic nation, it's a nation with a majority of Catholics, and he, he decides he, he can better use Catholicism to keep the country together than attacking it. And so Napoleon decides that um, it's better to make peace with the Catholic Church, and in 1801 he compromised and restored some of the traditional roles to the, the Pope of Rome. The clergy are still going to be salaried by France and not by Rome, and, um, but, and, and the papal states can return to the pope's control, but everything's sort of under this overarching French empire that's spreading all over Europe. Um, in 1804, something really interesting happens where Pope Pius VII is called upon by Napoleon to crown him as emperor. This is why I say it's a dictatorship. I mean, if you, get crown, if you get crowned as the emperor by the pope, you're trying to be like the Caesars of old. I mean, he's pretty clearly trying to imitate that in this uh, painting here. Um, when this happened at uh, Notre Dame in Paris, he also, crowned, he also had Pope Pius VII crown his wife, Josephine, as empress, and at this point, Ludwig van Beethoven, you ever heard of him before? Uh, crossed out his dedication to Napoleon in his third symphony because he, didn't, he thought Napoleon had gone too far and he crossed him out in his third symphony. And uh, Napoleon didn't really care what Beethoven wrote in his symphony because he had the whole world in his hand, or so it seems, right? Uh, this is a map here. You have the French Empire in the middle, and then you have the countries that are allied with Napoleon, like the Austrian Empire. Then you have these satellite nations. I mean, just a brutal war fought in Spain. Nasty on both sides, but eventually it falls to France. Uh, the Kingdom of Italy falls to France, Kingdom of Naples, the Confederation of the Rhine, and uh, over here the Grand Duchy of Warsaw, which we would probably call Poland, uh, and Prussia, and then you have Denmark and Norway. I mean, 
if you're if you're Portugal or the United Kingdom, you're getting pretty nervous, right? And uh, there's one other country over here, Russia. And so what happens is Napoleon finally uh, decides he's going to take Russia, raises an army of 600,000, and marches his way to Russia. The Russian Tsar is very clever and refuses to engage Napoleon in battle and just retreats, 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 and gives him Moscow. So Napoleon gets to Moscow, and there's, the city's empty. There's no people in it. And the city lights on fire, and it gets completely burned. And I think there's some question as to whether it was the Russians that started the fire or Napoleon and his people that started the fire. But here's the thing. Fall was there. Winter's around the corner. If you're going to stay in Russia and keep trying to chase after these Russian troops who are running away from you, he hadn't even gotten into a battle yet. You need a place where you can winter, some place where you can have shelter and you can have food and access to sanitation and everything else. And if Moscow is, in, in, is up in flames, what are you going to do? So they decide to go home. And on their way home, winter comes early that year. And it's a brutal winter with temperatures below freezing and snow. And the army just withers. And these Cossack uh, little raiding bands would come and attack them on the, the, the flanks. And they were eating their horses to survive. And it was just disaster. Hardly anybody makes it home, just a tiny percentage of the people that left. And they never even got to fight the Russians. And so when that happens, the rest of Europe, see, I'm telling the political history. I'm supposed to stick to how it relates to Catholicism. But it's such a, such a story, isn't it? Uh, the rest of Europe sees that this army is depleted. And they, they rise up. And they decide, if we all league together, we can fight against Napoleon and fight against France. And we can take them. And they do. And that is... Uh, when France goes back to the normal size of being France again. So very, very catastrophic, uh, like a world war here that happens in Europe that really affects Catholicism in a big way. Next, I want to talk about the Immaculate Conception of Mary, which comes in as a belief officially proclaimed in 1854. So this is sometime after uh, the Napoleonic Wars. But in 1854, Pope Pius IX proclaimed the Immaculate Conception of Mary as dogma. Now this is, to be clear, not that Jesus was born without sin, but that Mary was conceived without sin. So that she could then have G be, be holy, a holy vessel for having Jesus. And so the Immaculate Conception of, Jesus, or of Mary started in... Um, uh, well, the, the whole movement in, you know, has a whole prehistory to it. But 1571, there was a battle of Lepinato against the Ottoman Turks, and they won. They credited it to Mary. There's a resurgence of Mary in devotion. She's called the Queen of Heaven. She's understood as Mediatrix, which means the one that goes between God and people. Uh, in 1617, Pope Paul V said Mary was conceived without original sin. Pope Gregory the 15th in 1622 said Mary was conceived again with, without original sin. 1661, Alexander VII declared Mary's soul free from original sin. 1708, Pope Clement XI celebrated the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. So by the time we get to 1854 and Pope Pius IX's declaration as dogma, which means every Catholic must believe this, it was pretty well ingrained. Then we come to Another major council, this is called the First Vatican Council in 16, or 1869 to 1870. It was convoked by Pius IX, and it was 300 years since the Council of Trent. Now we have another council, and this council affirms the doctrine of papal infallibility, which is to say the Pope is not wrong. Um, he, he speaks correctly. He doesn't make mistakes. Um, at least when he's speaking ex cathedra, from the chair, then it's infallible. They, this council is called to respond to rationalism, liberalism, and materialism. The Enlightenment, again, is a movement from the 17th to 19th century that placed reason above revelation. It challenged authority. It raised up the individual as 
the uh, supreme arbiter of truth. And so this is the Catholic Church's way of responding to this anti-Catholic, anti-spiritual uh, movement. And it's not really spirit, anti-spiritual, but anti-authority movement. Because a lot of Enlightenment people believed in Christianity. Um, in 1870, a group called the Old Catholic Church broke off at this council uh, because they didn't want to accept papal infallibility. And then in 1870, King, we're in the age of pictures, look at that, King Victor Emmanuel II of Italy seized most of the papal states and we have the unification of Italy. Emmanuel II seized Rome and Pius XI, Pope Pius XI, became a prisoner in the Vatican. And so th at this point, the uh, Pope loses his what, what's called the temporal power. He still has ecclesiastical or church power, but he doesn't have power over a, um, a, a collection of nations or, or cities around him. Until uh, 1929, when Benito Mussolini declared the Vatican City a sovereign nation. And so the Vatican City is actually a country. It's the smallest country in the world. And it has its own law, its own police, and everything else within the city of Rome. Um, then, continuing on in our story, getting into the 20th century, in 1950, we have the Assumption of Mary. And this has nothing to do with what Mary assumed to be true or not. It has to do with the idea that Mary, since she did not have original sin, was uh, assumed into heaven. She ascended into heaven bodily, in body and soul. She did not die and go into a tomb like Jesus. She also ascended into heaven. And so that ends up in 1950 by Pope Pius XII. And then we come to another game changer, Second Vatican Council, which happened from 1962 to 1965. Another massive change within the Catholic Church. Uh, again, Mary is lifted up and venerated as uh, very uh, uh, worthy of, of veneration. P Paul VI proclaimed Mary the mother of the church. Uh, and made uh, the, the council, Second Vatican Council, was to declare the teachings clear to the modern world. They talk about the nature of the church, the mission of the laity, and religious freedom. And probably the biggest change is they allow mass in the vernacular language. So no longer when you go to a Catholic church do you hear it in Latin. If you're in America, you hear it in English. Um, and they uh, also do sacraments in that language, the local language as well. There's also a movement called ecumenism. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but it's where you try to find points of commonality between uh, multiple different um, sects of Christianity. So, if, for example, the Catholic Church is reaching out to the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Protestant Church is trying to find points of commonality, trying to find some sort of unity. And as a result of the Second Vatican Council, we have another breakaway from the Catholic Church called the Traditional Catholics, is what they like to call themselves, um, other people call them traditionalist Catholics because Catholics call themselves traditional too. So it's kind of a debate over a name. But um, I believe Mel Gibson's uh, part of this group that wants to say the Mass in Latin. They want to stick to the traditionalist pre-Second Vatican uh, way of being a Catholic. But the story's not over. 1968, we have the encyclical hum Humane Vitae, I probably butchered that, uh, by Pope Paul VI, who condemned birth control, abortion, and euthanasia. This doesn't mean that these are new teachings. It just means that there was official, an official church statement on that because this is, when the society brings up an issue, the church responds, right? Makes sense. And then in 1971, we have the beginning of what's called liberation theology, uh, people could argue it might have started before that, but this is when Gustavo Gutierrez wrote his book, A Theology of Liberation. Uh, this is a movement um, involving a lot of people in uh, South America, uh, Leonard Boff of Brazil, John Sobrino of Spain, Oscar Romero 
of El Salvador, Juan Luis Segundo of Uruguay, and they're fighting against poverty, they're fighting against systemic injustice, they're, they're politically active, they're, they're um, organizing, and it's a very controversial way of doing Catholicism that eventually gets accused of being too communist, too Marxist, in 1984 and 1986. And the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, which is what used to be the Inquisition, Inquisition accused the liberation theologians of uh, Marxist concepts. And then Pope John Paul II, as well as Benedict XVI, uh, denounced the movement of liberation theology. But it's very much still with us in, in uh, these countries today where they're organizing and fighting against uh, governments and trying to organize the poor. 1994, uh, Pope John Paul II made a proclamation affirming the ordination of men only for the priesthood of the church. In 2001, we had the sex abuse cases uh, break out, and major lawsuits claimed priests were sexually abusing minors. Some priests resigned, others were defrocked. You know what that means? It's where you're not a priest anymore. Others are jailed. There were financial settlements with many victims. Uh, one survey done in the United States from 1950 to 2002 found that 4% of priests in the United States are, had been accused of sexual misconduct. Uh, so a small percentage, and that's also who are accused, but in the, in the news, a very big issue, right? Uh, it's something that is constantly uh, being brought up. In 2013, Pope Benedict XVI resigned. The first pope to resign since Pope Gregory XII in the year 1415. Um, and uh, I was looking at his hat uh, in this picture here, and what I, what I see there, I believe, is Mary. And I, and I just find this, this whole Mary business so fascinating as a non-Catholic because I'm, I'm reading the Bible, and there's probably like, I don't even know how many verses about Mary in the whole Bible. You know, five, ten, maybe twenty. I don't know. I'd have to count them. Um, and how many, and, and, and there's no picture of God on his hat. And there's no picture of Christ on his hat, at least not this particular hat. But it's just Mary. And it just seems to me, you know, unusual, you know, noteworthy. Uh, but he had the, uh, the courage to resign from office when he felt that he was no longer able to function uh, adequately. And I, I appreciate that, certainly. Um, at which point in 2013, Pope Francis was elected, who is the first Latin American to be Pope and the first Jesuit. Uh, which brings us full circle back to talking about the Jesuits. So let's take a break, and we'll come back and look at the colonies and the Methodists.